here in AI at the Department of Informatics at King's and I have a visiting uh, professor position here. And uh, my background is in sort of formal logic, in particular non-monotonic logics. And then I got interested in argumentation theory as a way of doing non-monotonic logic. And then I got interested in communicative accounts of reasoning. How do, how do these uh, non-monotonic logics uh, underpin a joint deliberation, right, when we're communicating together and reasoning together? And then I started to look at theories of truth, and I began to sort of think about what truth and uh, how traditional theories of truth have informed the development of logic and the use of logics in AI. And so this is, in some sense, a culmination of some of my thinking and is currently under preparation in a, in a paper, so hopefully that will be submitted fairly soon. So, a brief overview of today's lecture. I'll, briefly, I'll give a brief, very brief survey of theories of truth. There's a huge amount more to be said than I could possibly say. Uh, just as a way of background um, to to um, then develop a pragmatist account of truth as a norm. And then in lecture two, I'll talk about the difference this conception of truth makes to how we should think about formalizing non monotonic logic. And then the difference this conceptualization of how we should think about non monotonic logic, what difference does that make uh, in, the, in, the, in the kind of wider societal context, in particular uh, with regard to the ethics of AI? and what I think about of as the inculturation of AI, the integration of future AI systems within a society. Okay, so a very brief overview of some of the philosoph main philosophical approaches to truth. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the standard sort of oldest, if you like, understanding of theory of truth is the so-called correspondence theory of truth, fathered by Aristotle. And the basic idea is that, you know, we have beliefs uh, uh, which may express propositions, so propositions are the contents of beliefs, and there is a correspondence, a vertical, if you like, correspondence relation between beliefs or propositions and facts in a mind-independent reality. So a proposition or belief is true if and only if it corresponds to the facts. Of course, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work in this, but... Fundamentally, one of the main key objections to this theory is, well, look, we've got these facts out there in a mind-independent reality. We've got these beliefs and propositions here in our head, as it were. How is it even intelligible to talk about something that's independent of mind, facts, and in particular the relationship between beliefs and propositions and a mind-independent reality? The very idea of stepping outside of our mental point of view and looking sideways at this relation between beliefs and propositions and mind-independent facts is, in, is unintelligible. And in fact, this has led to a kind of deflationary kind of resignment or resigning of this quote by Frey. Facts are just what propositions are when propositions are true. Right? They're basically synonymous. Right? This is the kind of deflationary upshot of these concerns about the intelligibility of a correspondence relation. We can, um, another, another issue of course is the truth of complex propositions. So you can have atomic propositions in the kind of Wittgensteinian sense of just picturing the world. The picturing is the correspondence relation. And then you have truth functional connectives which allow you to determine the truth of complex formulae like conjunctions, etc, etc. So that fight works fine for the cat is on the table and the mouse is on the table, perceptual beliefs. But what about more abstract kind of claims like climate change is anthropogenic, climate change is caused by humankind? How do you, you know, how do you kind of give a true functional account of these kinds of claims? Okay, so that's correspondence. Coherence theory uh, basically says that a belief or proposition is true if it coheres with our other beliefs or propositions. So truth is, as it were, an internal virtue or, or, or property of belief. What determines whether a belief is true is that it rationally coheres with our other beliefs. Okay? So, so this is the standard co coherence theory. Of course, main key objections to this are that you could have a internally consist consistent set of beliefs, but it might be completely wrong, like we see in scientific theorizing or reasoning. It also can lead to some sort of relativism, right? So, 
you know, I have a set of cons internally consistent set of beliefs S that infer P, and another internally consistent set of beliefs S prime that infer negation P. So P is true for S, negation P is true for S prime. And you can see that this kind of leads to a sort of a sort of relativism. Also, because only beliefs count as reasons for other beliefs, coherentists have a problem of, of how to constrain our beliefs, uh, how, how to have a kind of mind-independent reality constrain the beliefs. You know, they kind of lose sight of the connect, the vertical, as it were, connection between mind and world by positing that any belief can only be justified by another belief. Okay. Then the third kind of main class of theories, and, and arguably nowadays probably the most predominant amongst epistemologists uh, looking at, at, at truth, are, are deflationary theories of truth. So, you know, it, it might seem actually counterintuitive, but this really now is the pr predominant kind of understanding of truth. And basically, deflationists say, well, look, saying something is true makes no difference to just saying that thing. If I say, I believe P, it makes no difference to say, I believe P is true. If I'm going to say, I want to prove or I prove P, that's equivalent to saying, I prove P is true. If I wonder P, whether P, that's the same as saying, I wonder whether P is true. Right? So this is a kind of very deflationary approach. Um, now, this is, we call it, it's deflation since it's taking the metaphysics out of the, out of the equation, as it were. It's deflating the kind of metaphysical issues that arise in correspondence and coherence. But there are developments of deflationary approaches that are what you might call minimalist theories of truth. And probably this is the most popular version of deflationism about truth. Uh, and basically, it isolates the linguistic true, the predicate true, and it says, well, look, uh, it does have a linguistic function. Right? It's a li purely, this, this is kind of very much with a linguistic turn in philosophy, right? So it's, let's look at the linguistic function of truth. And, and there are a number of different linguistic functions, but an example would be, if you wanted to express the content of all of Einstein's thoughts were true, okay, without the use of the predicate true, you would need to express that as an infinite conjunction. If Einstein thought that snow is white, then the proposition that snow is white is true. And if he thought that snow is... So it's a, it's a device of generalization. Right? It, allow, it generalizes over all the thoughts and allows you to, to do that in a kind of linguistically uh, convenient way. Of course, the alternative would be to depart from ordinary English usage and say, well, for all P, if Einstein thought that P, then P. Okay, so it's really focusing on, on, on the, on the linguistic. There are other linguistic uh, functions. It can also kind of be used in what they call prosential theories of truth. That is a bit like how an, an anaphora works, but you know, can revisit that later if you're interested. Objections. Well, for one thing, does it really respect kind of fundamental kind of co correspondence and coherence intuitions about truth? I mean, they seem to sort of just be ignored. But I think an important objection is, well, why restrict ourselves just to the linguistic function of the predicate? Why not embrace a wholesome, descriptive and possibly prescriptive account of the linguistic and, and non-linguistic function. In other words, how truth informs and affects our practices. Okay? And, this, and this is where we, we, we start to kind of revisit some of... Um, just, just do that one, yeah? Okay. Maybe we can download it. I'm sorry to say I was right. <laughs> no, I never trust this. Never. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible how this became the world standard.
should be. Okay, thank you, Michael. So, just to continue, so, you know, let's think about the non-linguistic functions of truth, and this is, in some sense, requires that we revisit some of the ideas of, of the American pragmatists. Now, this was a, a school of thought that um, sort of kind of, as it was, started to develop in the late 19th, early 20th century. In particular, the main proponents were Charles S. Peirce, William James, uh, and John Dewey. And their basic insight was, look, Philosophical inquiry to metaphysical concepts should really pivot first and foremost from the effects these concepts have on our practices, not just linguistic but non-linguistic practices. Now, one particular feature of, of, of the pragmatist epistemology is that they reject the empiricist claim that perceptual beliefs, like the cat is on, on the table, uh, that these have somehow special epistemic authority that they're self-authenticating, that they provide firm foundations for knowledge on which you can then build, right? Because from their point, their point of view, all beliefs, including perceptual beliefs, are fallible. They're the result of interpretation and they be, be overturned right, by further inquiry. Right? So, so, so they reject the empiricist claim. They, 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 they look to say, well, look, let's think about these metaphysical concepts in terms of how they affect our practices. But on the other hand, even though they reject this empiricist claim, they still acknowledge that reality constrains our beliefs, our non -belief, perceptual and non-perceptual beliefs. So they avoid the danger of coherentism, right, which kind of, in some sense, allows for a detached sort of a, a relationship between beliefs and the world. It kind of spins, coherentism can be argued to sort of be untethered to reality. It sort of spins off frictionless in the void. So... So that the, the pragmatist said, yes, our perceptual and non-perceptual beliefs are constrained by reality. To, and how are they constrained? They are constrained, and this is the crucial point, they're constrained to the extent that their implied or inferred experiential predictions are verified or overturned by our practices of inquiry broadly construed. Okay, so let me just give a, an example, perhaps, which I highlight some of the features. Um, the, well, before I come to the example, to po I just want to point out that their, their view built is kind of is in the tradition of scientific, more, uh, 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 scientific theories, of how scientific theories evolve. Okay, so when we think about inquiry broadly construed, okay, we're thinking about inferences over beliefs, right, the, the experiential predictions that our beliefs generate, we can think of the beliefs as scientific hypotheses. Right? And then our percept, our, our, the experiential predictions are, are the predictions we, uh, as to what we will observe on the basis of our beliefs, and the expected um, perceptual outcomes of action. So just like in scientific theories, right? you have a scientific theory, it generates predictions which can be confirmed or disconfirmed by observation or by conducting experiments and seeing if those experiments, can, the results of those experiments, experientially confirm or disconfirm our scientific theories. And the extent to which experience validates these predictions, then of course yields feel, feedback that then serves to further evolve our beliefs, or in the case of scientific theories. Right? So we get this confirmation, disconfirmation, and that enables evolution and the subsequent changes to our scientific theories. The argument is essentially they, they took that and said, well, the same applies to beliefs. Now, they were also um, uh, real advocates of Darwinian natural selection. So you can see the same process. You can look at it from a point of, from a, from a, through a Darwinian natural selection point of view. Think of beliefs as your genotype. Right? And the experiential predictions those beliefs generate are the phenotype. How, those, how the genes are expressed, and the extent to which experience validates the predictions right, is, is a measure of the fitness of our beliefs, right? so that beliefs evolve so that experience validates predictions. Right? So we've got beliefs and there's kind of a fitness function, and the fitness function is determined by the extent to which 
that the experiential predictions of these beliefs are confirmed by, by our, sensory, our sensory apparatus. Right? So they, they were very much uh, in kind of in line with the scientific theorizing and uh, 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 you know, the scientific model and, and, and Darwinian natural selection. So let me give you an example. Um, supposing you're returning from work and you have a belief, a default expectation based on prior experience that there is going to be water in the glass on the table. Okay? But you're doubting your expectation because the lights, kitchen lights are turned off. It's, it's very dark. Now, that belief can be shown to be ill-adapted to the current environment. Right? So think again in terms of natural selection. I.e. false because your senses fail to confirm the, the, exper the inferred experiment experiential predictions of that belief. Right? The, the ob For example, um, the on the basis of that belief, you would have a predicted experiential outcome, that, uh, which is the observation that there is water in the glass when you direct your attention. So it's, it's a dark kitchen. You, you, you're wondering about, you're, you're in doubt. Is there water in the glass? You direct your attention. Okay, that's all right. Uh, Shall I? Okay, um, it's an act of inquiry. In further doubt, right, as to whether P is the case, you inquire further by the action of tipping the glass to your lips. And your senses fail to confirm the predicted outcome of the, think of it as an experiment an action, the tactile sensation of water at your lips. Okay? So, so your belief has been disconfirmed, it's been shown to be false, ill-adapted to the current environment, because of the success of these predicted outcomes would have confirmed that P was adapted to your environment. But they failed, these experiments. They've not, they've not, they've not served to confirm the, 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 the veracity of your belief that there is water in the glass. Right. So, so I'm just now building a story of, of a general kind of inquiry that sort of starts with just perception and basic action. Right. Okay, now you, your beliefs, in, which by the way include the default expectation H that your partner is at home, are revised, right, which think not, not the usual kind of principles of belief revision, non monotonic logics, are revised to include negation P. There is no water in the glass. From your revised theory and your default expectation that your partner typically fills a glass of water for when you arrive, get come back home, you infer non-monotonically, defeasibly, that your partner is not at home. Right? So you've got, as in non-monotonic logics, you have kind of two defeasible inferences that are in conflict. Your partner is at home. Your partner is not at home. You are then motivated, prompted to inquire further. You consult your phone. And it's, it reminds you that actually it's your partner's mother's birthday. You add that to your revised theory. And now this is sufficient to arbitrate, given you know this extra information, in favor of the non monotonic inference that your partner is not at home. Right, so now you've got your updated beliefs. Now, your partner, the fact that you're, now you have the belief your partner is not at home, this generates further experiential predictions. For example, there will be no response if I call out my partner's name. And if there is no response, again, we're using our sense apparatus to confirm our beliefs. Right? So, this is, so we start with kind of sensory confirmation or disconfirmation of, of, of the experiential predictions of our beliefs. We then move to kind of like more system two kind of conscious inference, non-monotonic inference. That generates more experiential predictions, and so on and so forth. This is a cycle. Now, one of the key features of the pragmatist approach was that they emphasized the ideal of intersubjectivity in inquiry. Our perceptual beliefs are confirmed to the extent that their experiential predictions are shared by the many. Right? Number one. So that's on the perceptual side of things. Percep Inquiry as kind of just perception. 
but also the reasoning component of inquiry I just described, you know, the individual sort of reasoning non-monotonically, um, that, that, that part of inquiry that yields predictions is ideally conducted jointly with others. So, you know, now let's look at some of these complex propositions like climate change is, 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 is caused by man, humankind, right? Climate change is anthropogenic. Y you assert that, that climate change is anthropogenic. I, you know, say, well, no, it isn't. You know, I'm a, I'm a climate change denier. Inquiry is ignited. Right? And you both ideally, of course this is you know, not often the case, unfortunately, but you both ideally combine your epistemic resources to jointly resolve the doubt, to jointly come to an agreement. You combine cited evidence and your inferential capacities in reasoned debate and argument, in the ideal case, of course, uh, and, and try to come to an agreement right, as to whether climate change is anthropogenic. Okay, so I like this quote from William James. Um, it's not that we start with facts and inquire. Facts are the outcome of inquiry. Right? There is no appeal, appeal to standards outside a uh, process of inquiry. The question should not be what is a fact, but what makes for good inquiry. And here's the quote, truth happens to an idea. It becomes true, is made true by events. Its verity is, in fact, an event, a process. The process, namely, of verifying itself. Right? Truth happens to an idea. It's the outcome of inquiry. Now, as I said, the, the, the pragmatists had a, had, a, had a wholesome kind of fallibilist epistemology. All beliefs are fallible. Of course, as I wanted to emphasize, that did not, they did not deny the constraints that a kind of mind-independent reality has on our beliefs. But given this idea of a, defa a fallibist epistemology, that also suggests, of course, that beliefs can be said to be true to the extent that they've not been overturned by inquiry. This brings in credences, right? kind of a, a more statistical uh, interpretation. We'll, we'll come to that in the second lecture. Um, so beliefs are true to the extent that they have not been overturned by an inquiry, where inquiry is instigated by positive reasons for doubt, by indications that beliefs are ill-adapted to the current environment. Okay, the glass of water on the there's, got, there's water in the glass on the table. There's a reason for doubt. The kitchen lights are off. I inquire further. I direct my attention. I I, I take the glass to my lips. I have experiential predictions. Those experiential predictions are disconfirmed disconfirm the veracity of that belief. I then inquire further, kind of individually inquiring, as it were, by applying non monotonic inference. I'm using inquiry, I, I appreciate, in a very broad sense. But I think this fits in well with the pragmatists' broad construal of inquiry. But um, we talk about beliefs being true to the extent that inquiry has confirmed them. But Charles S. Peirce, in particular, speaks of truth tout court, absolute truth. And somebody who, uh, Cheryl Misak, who's an expert in, on American pragmatism and, and in particular Peirce, interprets Peirce's, Charles Peirce's theory of truth in the, by, by appealing to two conditionals. CP1, if P survives prolonged inquiry, then P is true. Now, this is a normative claim that any pragmatist ideally should accept. I mean, basically, it says, given this account of, of inquiry broadly construed, if P passes all falsifi falsifying tests, that's all we could ask of it. If P survives prolonged inquiry, then P is true. So it's a normative claim. It's saying if you buy into this broad construal of inquiry and falsification, kind of scientific Darwinian falsification, then that's all we could ask of it. So that's, that's, what, that's, that's one conditional. The other conditional is, in fact, is, I think, probably the more interesting one, actually, from the point of view of truth, which is the following. It's kind of like, it's a biconditional, but it, it doesn't, it's not in an analytic sense biconditional. I mean, this is, CP2 is a subjunctive, not indicative conditional. It says, if P is true, 
then one would expect of P that it survives prolonged inquiry. It's an expectation that is pragmatically significant, leading us to expect something of experience. So compare this with, with, with a correspondence theory, theorist's expectation. A correspondence theorist might say, well, if P is true, then we can expect of it that it corresponds to the world. But given that this mind-independent reality is, by definition, mind-independent, what kind of experience could validate that expectation? That's the key thing about pragmatism. It looks to things that we can experience in the world as, as ways of validating. Right? So this conditional CP2 is an expectation that is pragmatically significant in leading us to expect something of experience. If P is true, then one would expect of P that it survives prolonged inquiry. There's a kind of very mo there's a modal flavor here. Yeah, I'm a bit puzzled by the expectation there. Mm. So the, the upper implication is sort of, that I, I see it as a definition, right? Mm -hmm. The prolonged inquiry survival mm -hmm. is sufficient. So I, I take that to be a definition. Mm -hmm. But I can't do the same here. So it seems as if it depends on me, right? Uh, because uh, I should have that attitude of expectation, right? Uh, and if I don't, it's me failing. It's not about truth. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is kind of me yeah. aligning to something which is independent of my mm -hmm. uh, mental state, which didn't seem to play any role in the, yeah. in the previous one. So I, I, I see a lot of asymmetry. There, there, there is asymmetry. That, that, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about he initially presented it as a biconditional. And she misacts kind of separating out into two because they say, no, actually, we should think of them as independent conditionals. And I think it's your point that, you know, you know, I might be sort of, my, my modes of, or, or, or methods of inquiry might be very specious, very yeah. suspect. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's where principled inquiry comes in and the intersubjectivity of inquiry. So Pierce, when Pierce talks about prolonged inquiry, he really, he's saying the ideal is, 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 yeah, is inquiry so amongst many, perceptual predictions verified by the many. In the right, and so if I, if I take, rather than one, like uh, uh, the uh, relevant scientific community expects mm -hmm. uh, of the evidence, so then, then I, I, I see that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of misled by the subject. By the subject of? Yeah, by one. Yeah. Oh, so by if, if I take that to be sort of the scientific community, then, then I, I see the same. Yeah. Okay. But it's just that I don't know anything about Peirce. No. <laughs> this is a very controversial part of Peirce, because Peirce basically, first of all, said, truth is that which would be arrived at, at the ideal end point of inquiry, by an ideal community of inquirers. But that then brings in some sort of metaphysical baggage. Well, what is this idealized end point of inquiry? Or an ideal? It's a kind of metaphysical question begging. Um, but I... I think so see, if B doesn't equal M P, then you know the logicians would expect that not to be false. So I mean, it, it sort of makes direct sense to me. You know, yeah. if you refer to that as you know community and maybe maybe the way I'm going to interpret this is not so. It, it is really as C P two. If P is true, then one would expect of P that it survives prolonged inquiry as a regulative assumption of inquiry, a, a kind of constitutive norm of inquiry. In other words, the very idea that participants engage in inquiry right, is meaningless without this kind of constitutive norm, this regulative assumption, CP2. Think of a, you know, a game of bridge or chess. You've got, you've got constitutive norms, rules. Right? The rules of chess are such that, well, chess would be meaningless without those rules. Or bridge, you know, uh, you know, you've got rules in bridge. It, bri you know, I mean, the game of bridge would be meaningless without these rules and norms governing the way it's played, as opposed to contingent norms like 
in breach of conven bidding conventions, right? Now they're, con they're, they're contingent. They're not essential to the very, to the very game of bridge. So similarly, my, my kind of interpretation of, of the CP2 is that it is a regulative assumption. It's, it's constitutive of inquiry itself. This is what inquirers have, an unconscious engagement with this law when they are inquiring. And indeed, this was this idea, although was taken up by the philosopher Hugh Price, but he didn't actually reference Perth, interestingly enough. So he kind of comes at it maybe somewhat from, a, from, the, from, a, from the side. In a, in a paper in 2003 called Truth as Convenient Friction. He argues, Price, that in these kinds of dialogues where you're making assertions about what is the case, disagreements invoke an implicit appeal to a standard of correctness. So that not only is one required to be sincere, a norm, sincerity, and justified given one's own beliefs, but this truth norm uh, suggests that there is an unconscious engagement with a third, as it were, truth norm. If it's the case that not P, then it's incorrect to assert that P. If not P, then these are at first sight prim prima facie grounds for a sensory assertion of P. So if it's the case that P, and I say not P, Heichel might sort of see this as grounds for disapproval. And the idea is that it's very similar to this kind of regulative assumption of inquiry, a constitutive norm of inquiry, right? What the idea is that once disagreement comes into the picture, this motivates resolution of the disagreement. Mm -hmm. It ideally motivates dialogue and joint reasoning. So the idea Price develops is that truth norm is immediately, TN, is immediately assumed to be violated right, by someone with whom an interlocutor disagrees. Right? Disagreement per se is thus considered grounds for disapproval, which in turn motivates resolution of the disagreement. And I think it's worth reading this quote, this quote. Without truth norm, TM, Price says, differences of opinion would simply slide past each other. Differences of opinion would be, seen, would be as inconsequential as differences of preference or aesthetic taste. With TM, with this unconscious engagement with this truth norm, disagreements automatically become normatively loaded right, because of the censure, the disapproval. And, disagree and the norm makes what would otherwise be no-fault disagreements into unstable social situations whose instability is only resolved by argument and consequent agreement. And it provides an immediate incentive for argument. And then it holds out to the successful arguer the reward as opposed to the censure or disapproval. The reward consisting in her community's positive evaluation of a dialectical position. Okay, so I say, you know, climate change is anthropogenic. Uh, Heichel says it's not anthropogenic. Immediately, we kind of did unconscious engagement. We need to agree. You know, and it mo it's mo there's a kind of underlying sense that there is disapproval, that there is censure, because one is claiming something, you know, w which is... The other thing is, 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 as it were, opposed by the truth of the matter. But if you look at this, this, this norm of price, firstly notice it only applies to explicit, explicit disagreement about assertions in dialogue. So it only locates this norm as operating in dialogue with others. But what about inquiry to resolve uncertainty more generally? I might simply ask the question, or be asked, is climate change anthropogenic? You'd expect some kind of injunction to resolve, uh, answer that question, given some uncertainty. What about individuals inquiry rather than in dialogue? Right? What about perceptual beliefs about the environment? There is water in the glass on the table. Okay, so these are kind of left out of his picture of, of this truth norm operating in dialogue. Moreover, what explains the censure, the disapproval? Why should that engage? Why should 
where does this disapproval come from, the censure, and, and why then does that disapproval engage the interlocutors? I think we need to ask the question and provide answers for where this disapproval comes from, the censure. And I'm going to point to some evolutionary arguments for the origin of reasoning itself as providing an explanation. It's a fairly straightforward explanation of why there is this kind of immediate sense of disapproval when one disagrees with an interlocutor. And in particular, I'm going to draw on two theories of the origin of reasoning that fall under the general banner, banner of the social brain hypothesis, which is that human cognition largely evolved to answer the, dem the, the demands of the social world. Okay. So there are what, what might call cooperative accounts of the origins of reasoning. Uh, Well-known figures in this who have proposed this uh, include Tomasello and Norman. And basically the idea is that, look, reasoning evolved because it allowed our ancestors to build a shared understanding of their environment so that they could then agree on actions, collaborative actions and policies that they might want to put into place. I, I, we, we are, uh, I keep picking the new hiker, but we are proto-human beings way back on the savannah, desperate for water. I say water is to the north. Heikel says water is to the south. In such a case, the correctness matters if we are going to cooperate on the practical endeavour of finding water. Right? Indeed, the agreement about finding water it yields utility for the community, practical utility. It's instrumentally useful to resolve that disagreement. This is why the disagreement needs to be resolved, why there is a sense of disapproval, right? because it undermines our collaborative project, you know, uh, collaborative practical projects. Similarly, climate change is anthropogenic. Deciding that matter, resolving that agreement, will affect policy. Once a policy is put into place, the action, the experiment, it re the climate it yields certain predictions climate, you know, that the policy will give you the required outcomes, of, which is to, of course, reduce global warming. Right? So this is a cooperative account of how reasoning evolved that explains why cooperative why disagreement matters, why there is disapproval, and why that engages us in resolving the disagreement. But there is a, well, I, I, mean, I call it a, a Machiavellian account, arg, account of how reasoning evolved. And this is the argumentative theory of reasoning, which is uh, presented by Mercier and Sperber. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. But this made big headlines everywhere in the philosophical and scientific literature in 2011. And it's still actually quite a, has a powerful grip on many people's understanding of how reasoning evolved. And the story goes as follows. Reasoning evolved essentially to enable communication. So if I'm communicating something to you, right, you need to be epistemically vigilant just in case I'm trying to manipulate you right, into, into doing my bidding, into, 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 into acting giving up some of your resources for my practical projects. Right. <clears throat> so you need to be vigilant so that you're not, you're not manipulated, so that you don't sacrifice your own practical goals in order to help fulfill my practical goals. So one way to be vigilant is just to reject everything you say. I'm just going to reject what you say. I'm not going to believe anything you say. The idea is that reasoning evolves so that I, as the hearer, the receiver of the information, <coughs> would look for reasons against what you say, to be vigilant. Likewise, you, the sender, knowing that I'm looking for reasons against what you say, are disposed to look for reasons in favour of your claim. Right? So you can see that this explains, and this is, been posed, this is the, one of the main reasons, uh, <coughs> arguments for this series that explains the confirmation bias. There are natural dispositions when we ha make a claim to look for reasons in support of our claim and ignore reasons against our claim. Right? So reasoning evolves from this argumentative, ultimately communicative function. But again, notice this Machia alternative Machiavellian theory also explains why correctness matters. 
why there is disapproval that then arises uh, when there is disagreement. I don't want to be manipulated, but ultimately it's sourced, grounded in the realization of practical outcomes. It's about instrumental utility. Right? My instrumental utility is compromised uh, if you disagree, if we have disagreement. And I need to resolve this disagreement to make sure that I don't sacrifice my own goals and I appropriately uh, you know, assist you in realizing your goals. Sorry, I'm just curious. Yeah. So the game theoretically, I see the only equilibrium is the internet of trust in anyone. Right. Right. And so, do you know how, if they face this kind of. Yeah. Because uh, if, if you push this. Yeah, you know, I, I know. It's like you have a free rider problem in which, yeah. You know, Nash, the only sort of unique Nash equilibrium is, you know, I never trust you. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, that's the idea, their, their idea is that reasoning evolved to overcome this epistemic bottleneck that results from the kind of game theoretic interpretation. That, that, that was the purpose of reasoning. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah. this, this reasoning evolved to kind of overcome this, this epistemic bottleneck. So both accounts explain why correctness matters, why there is disapproval right, when there is disagreement. And the idea, of course, that this disapproval evolved as a form of social sanction, signaling, look, disagreement threatens instrumental utility. Right? Both accounts of how reasoning evolved explain where this disapproval comes from. It comes from the fact that when there is disagreement, instrumental utility, the realization of practical goals by individuals and, co uh, and collectives is, 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 is uh, compromised. So disagreement motivates resolution of, dis of disagreement. We then have epistemic utility in virtue of downstream instrumental utility. It makes a difference, right, that we decide the issue of whether masks do or do not reduce spread of the virus, because that has downstream instrumental utility for the community at large. As I said, the Machiavellian theory also explains the confirmation bias. Right? But so does the cooperative account. You look, you know, you claim is water to the north, my claim is water to the south. So why not you just go for look for evidence for water to the north? I'll look for evidence for water to the south. I'll ignore, I, I won't look for claim evidence for, for, for the alternative because we're dividing up the epistemic labor. Right? And <coughs> And with individual reasoning as a limiting case of dialogue, we can then see that joint inquiry and dialogue not only increases the pool of information right, accessible to deciding the matter, your, the information you have about where the water is, the information I have, but also that the confirmation biases cancel each other out so that reasoning proceeds in a more rational way, let's say, by really kind of bringing together the arguments and the reasons for claims from different parties. So this is, this is also demonstrating, and it's also a point made by Mercier and Sperber, that, that reason is conducted best when engaged in dialogue. It's a fairly, I think it's a fairly intuitive uh, point. Okay, now the third little piece I want to add to this story is, is to appeal to um, the work of the philosopher Bernard Williams, uh, very well known uh, uh, British philosopher who, um, you know, I think some of you may be familiar with, it, familiar with the idea of pragmatic genealogies, like a, a Nietzsche's genealogy of morals. So the idea is what these philo sometimes the philosophers do, they'll, they'll take a hypothetical state of nature and they'll say, let's imagine this concept was not there within the social kind of infosphere, or the, in social epistemology, in the, kind of, in the social sphere. What would be missing? if this concept were not there, in this kind of hypothetical state of nature. Right? And, but, and Williams makes the argument that, this comes slightly to it, in some sense to your point, Heichel, that, that it's not enough that truthfulness serves purely instrumental, uh, um, is, is purely instrumental. Individual contributors, so we've got a collective, a community of individuals, but one individual might say, well, look, I'm not going to bother looking for evidence for where the water is. I'll leave that to others. I'm a free rider. Right? 
Also, individual contributors may be deceptive, right? If, if my instrumental value is served at the expense of the of, of the collab the projects, the practical goals of the community, right? I might deceive. I might, you know, violate this norm of sincerity. Right? And then, of course. Communities may be self-deceptive in favouring tribal binding utility over long-term instrumental utility. So, in some sense, you know, you have the communities of vaccine uh, deniers who say that it's causing major diseases. Now, it's it's useful for them to affirm that belief jointly because it serves to bind their tribe. Right? It's a kind of tribal binding belief, but it's in the long term, it's not instrumentally useful. So Bernard Williams develops an account, and basically it's, it's uh, of why we would have come to intrinsically value truth, not just because of its instrumental value. It's intrinsically valuable. These norms of truthfulness, being accurate, being sincere according to one's own beliefs, engaging in, in, in rational joint inquiry, they need to be valued for their own sake if instrumental value is to be realized. So it's kind of, a, it, it's what, uh, there's um, Matthew Coelho's is a, in a book, a great, a wonderful book called Pragmatic Genealogies. He calls this self-effacing, self-effacing functionality. That the instrumental utility is, is realized by a concept in virtue of not directly appealing to instrumental utility, but to some intrinsic value. Okay, so now I come to my proposal uh, for, for the truth norm, which is inspired by, 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 by Charles Peirce, Charles C.S. Peirce. And here it is. So this is an alternative to, to, to Hugh Price's norm. If P is doubted, now that could be not just when somebody disagrees with me, but when I'm thinking individually is, is, is climate change anthropogenic, or uh, when my when I doubt my perceptual that my, my perceptual predictions of my beliefs are doubted, that the, the kitchen lights are dark, right? and establishing whether P yields utility, I've explained uh, why um, instrumental utility would have you know the, of, of 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 resolving disagreements. Then these are prima facie grounds for inquiring so as to establish P, whether P. In other words, what to resolve the uncertainty, resolve the doubt. Right? That's essentially my conception of, of the truth norm. Right. Of course, you might ask yourself, well, yes, fair enough. This norm you know, gets inquiry going when P is doubted. But what about this claim establishing whether P yields utility? Do you, do you typically kind of does one typically think about the instrumental utility of, of, of resolving a disagreement in a kind of, kind of conscious way? I mean, it may not be apparent that there is instrumental utility from resolving the doubt, downstream instrumental utility. However, I would argue, there is an expected meta-utility of assuming by default that there is utility. Right? Okay, there's a kind of expected meta-utility that, look, Typically, resolving disagreements uh, enables us to achieve our goals. This is kind of a very kind of unconscious engagement with this concept, right? So let's just assume by default that that's always the case, because typically it, it does help us realize our practical goals. Of course, we can switch it off sometimes, but the other reason reason why it might operate by default is because of, the, of this intrinsic valuing of truthfulness that I pointed to. Right? That is, it's not just about the intrinsic, the, the instrumental utility of resolving the disagreement, but because resolving disagreement is intrinsically valued. Right? And this is where I come to Bernard Williams' proposal for why we came to intrinsically value truthfulness, the norms of sincerity, accuracy, and and, 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 and rational inquiry. So it explains why this 
normative injunction operates by default unless unless there are positive reasons to doubt that resolving uncertainty yields utility. For example, if P is an ascetic claim or, a, or an expression of preference, I like dark chocolate, you like milk chocolate, well, uh, what, where, where's your, you know. Uh, I, I personally, uh, and we can talk about this afterwards, also think that this norm applies to ethical claims, and so I believe the ethical claims are truth apt. They legitimately can be said to be true or false. Well, actually, credence, I much prefer credence. But, um, I, but we can talk about that off, off, offline afterwards. Um, or you might switch the norm off when there's only limited instrumental utility in view. Because, you know, if you were just to blindly abide by this norm, you'd be inquiring forever. When do you ever have absolute certainty about anything? You know, we're not constantly sitting there, uh, you know, brains in vats or in some kind of solipsistic ivory tower, inquiring, because that would lead to just pure paralysis. We would act. Right? So we don't inquire indefinitely, but we satisfy. Sufficient credence. I've inquired sufficiently so that, you know, I can confidently act. And we can actually bring in here um, Ramsey's um, subjective probabilities, actually. It's very much related to... Ramsey was very much influenced by C.S. Peirce, really strongly influenced by, by, by Peirce. Um, so this is, the, the, in classical computer science, of course, this is the classic sort of exploration versus exploitation dilemma. You know, when do you actually act rather than just keep inquiring? Okay. Right. So, let's look at the norm again. If P is doubted and establishing whether P yields utility, then these are prima facie grounds for inquiry so as to establish whether P. Now, not just any kind of inquiry, not like ro ro you know, rolling a dice is, not, is, is, not a, is a very specious form of inquiry, but, but individual and joint or dialogical inquiry governed by prescriptive norms of truthfulness. So when I'm individually reasoning about my partner being at home, I abide by certain prescriptive norm for how I should inquire. Or when we engage in dialogue about whether climate change is anthropogenic, there are, you know, there are prescriptive norms that, that suggest we, this is how we should inquire, inquire. Now, in the second lecture, I will point to these norms as they, as they manifest in communication and dialogue as being essentially grounded in non-monotonic logics. And that that's how we should, not only the way, but a key, I think a key message of, of, of these two lectures is, is that we should really look to a dialogical turn in logic to underpin communicative accounts of inquiry, dialogue. Ones that would incorporate the AI systems of the future in dialogue with humans. Okay? So, not just any inquiry, but principled inquiry governed by norms. Okay, so we've got this this example here of uh, you know an individual inquiring. They believe their partner's at home. They revise their beliefs with a glass of water is not on the table. So now they have at home and not at home as two conflicting non-monotonic inferences. They look to their calendar. It's their mother partner's mother's birthday. So they now arbitrate in favour of their partner not being at home. This then generates a new experiential prediction that there will be no response when the partner, when you call out the partner's name. So that's the individual. And then we've got joint distributed inquiry um, about uh, the, 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 the veracity or the, the truth of climate, the climate change being anthropogenic. Now I'm going to end um, with another 10 to 15 minutes, maybe maximum. Um, to talk about, see, so far, uh, and as I pointed out with Price's account, these, these notions of the normative status of truth only apply when it, to, to individuals, well, actually in dialogue mostly, but also I'm saying to individuals inquiry, as in read, inference, individual or joint inference amongst many. But what about, what about these perceptual beliefs? Like, the glass of water is on the, you know, there's, there's water in the glass on the table, the, or the, the cat is on the table. What about, 
how does the truth norm apply in, in these situations when it's trying to establish the truth of perceptual beliefs? Well, I suggest that the answer can be found by looking towards um, recent uh, work in, in what, what's called predictive processing theories of cognition. So these are all the rage at the moment, right? They are, this has been proposed as a unifying account of cognition, of perception and action. There are people working in this neuroscience, in computational neuroscience, in philosophy of mind, in all the cognitive sciences. It, 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 it's also got, has a very information theoretic basis. And here, just a, a small selection of, of references, but there are hundreds of papers and, and many books. Uh, in particular, a book I really like recently is Anil Seth's book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness, which also tries to explain the phenomenology, phenomenology of consciousness in terms of this predictive processing theory of cognition. So let's just very briefly review this theory. Uh, it's going to be a very high level review. We have a naive understanding, perhaps, of the brain constructing complete, a, a complete corresponding picture of the world from noisy sensory data. This might be considered sort of a naive understanding. We get all this sensory data in, and we kind of like paint a kind of picture of the world in some kind of Cartesian theatre or whatever. Okay. But of course, this is completely intractable. And it just does not make, you know, from the point of view of cognition and computation. Right? What is needed is a pragmatically useful model. And what is useful at any point in time? What is useful is what is unexpected, what is surprising, sense data from the environment. So the idea is we, we evolve uh, in a society in which we we, we, we learn certain default, we have certain default priors. They're, actually, they're thought of as probabilistic causal models of expected environments. So we go about, we have these assumed expectations about the environments we will find ourselves in at any particular moment. Right? These are your, your, your default learned priors. Causal probabilistic models of environments we expect to find ourselves in at any moment in time. Right? And these environments bound are predicted sensory states. So these models generate predictions about what sense data we're going to get in at any moment in time. And of course, the familiarity with these environments, of course, are good for our survival. Right? We, we want to be in environments which we, which we have experienced before, which we know how to act. And what is useful is the sense data right, that, that is unexpected, that, that, that contradicts, that challenges our expected sensory predictions that are generated from our internal models of the world. So, and clearly, surprising features are useful in guiding action because if we attend to the surprising features, then this guides us in how we can act to change the world to keep us in the bounds of our expected environments. Right? So it, surprising data, by attending to surprising data, this allows, this kind of motivates us to act, as it were, to change the world so that it aligns more with what we expect. Now, how does the brain manifest this kind of, um, uh, 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 of, um, of, of cognitive, uh, cognitive narrative, as it were? Basically, the, what the brain does is it approximates Bayesian inference. Right? It, what, what it needs to do is it infers a model of the environmental causes of sense data using perception and action to minimize prediction error. So, let, let, prediction error, and I'll, I'll explain with, with the story in a minute. So the prediction error, remember, the brain is interested in surprising data because it tells the brain, look, you're not in an environment in which you expect to be in. Something surprising, maybe you need to act to make sure you find yourself in an environment you are expected to be in because that's good for your survival. Right? So you've got this incoming sense data right, that challenges a prediction. There's a prediction that there is a glass of, there's water in the glass on the table. 
the incoming sense data that say there is no glass of water on the table. So there's a prediction error between what I predict and what my sense data is telling me. <coughs> and the brain's main function is in minimizing this, this error, re re resolving, as it were, the doubt. Sorry. Yeah. The doubt is that how can the pragmatism and, um, account for the origin of our belief, of our um, expectation? Because since, uh, uh, from uh, what I uh, understood, the pragmatism ignores uh, the relation between our mind and the world outside the world uh, mind independent, how can explain the higher uh, structure of our belief or of our expectation? How we form our expectation expectations? That yeah. seems to be quite. Uh, um, with a difficult uh, structures, with quite com complex complexes. How can yeah. you uh, First, to be clear, I mean, pragmatism certainly does not ignore the effects of a mind independent world on. I mean, that's very crucial, right? It, it really says, no, look, we have some expe expectations, and the world out there is giving us sense data, and our beliefs evolve, as I've described by virtue of, 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 of resolving the doubt between our predictions and the sense data. A second question you ask, well, how do, where do we get these default priors in the first place? So, of course, this is a major challenge. Some will point to kind of basic, kind of evolutionarily hard-coded mechanisms that gets the process off the ground. So, Kantian categories of, you know, our space and time are somehow, you know, like we're born with these and that's how we get the process going and, it, and there's bootstrapping of that. But of course, the, to be honest, the, 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 the approximate Bayesian inference does provide, in some sense, a partial answer to this. I and mean, it's very complex, the way in which it, the brain does this. It approximates Bayesian inference. But uh, it does, I mean, I can offline perhaps go into a bit more detail about that. So, so this is the picture, right? I walk into my uh, kitchen, right? I, I've walked into that kitchen many times. Um, what I'm experiencing is not the sense data from which I construct a picture. My actual experience, my phenomenology, is the predictions my own brain are generating about what I will experience. It's a, effectively, it's controlled hallucination, right? or a kind of simulation. I mean, we can even go make, you know, into matrix territory here, but... But no, but I mean, really, this is what these latest theories, unifying theories of cognition, suggest. Right? That your experience, moment to moment, are, is actually constituted by your sensory predictions. Right? So you return for, as I said, let's go through this example again. So I'm returning from work, the, the, the lights are off, I doubt P. Right? I then inquire, I focus my attention on the glass. I raise the glass to my lips. Right? There are experiential predictions of directing attention of glass to water on my lips. Right? That these are these predictions right, are not validated by the incoming sense data, and that's the only sense data that, right, uh, that uh, uh, as it were, goes to up to my conscious level. It's basically a very machine learning inspired idea, right? So we have a high, in the cortical hierarchy, okay, we have at the lowest level, we've got the world here, at the lowest level we have raw statistical data. Data goes up this hierarchy and it is at, and there are the levels of abstraction. So at the top of the hierarchy we have concepts, abstract concepts, got water in glass. Below, further down, edges, boundaries, right? At, this is kind of very machine learning. At the bottom, raw statistical data. Now, the brain, right, I walk into the kitchen, I have a first guess hypothesis, delta I. Amongst all my possible hypotheses about the environment I'm in, I have a first good guess. That generates a prediction, right, P equals water in glass, as well as other sensory expectations. These move down the hierarchy, the cortical hierarchy. What goes up the hierarchy from the world, from my sense sensory apparatus, 
are only the prediction errors. Everything, so S1 to Sn, these sensory predictions, are confirmed by the world. They don't go up. Those sense data doesn't go up the hierarchy. Only, only what is, what is doubted. What, 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 what experience with predictions are thrown into doubt. These prediction errors are the only data that goes up the hierarchy. And in fact, the number of neurons going down in our, in our brains um, uh, that are uh, um, going down the hierarchy, if you like, from, from the inside of the brain to the outside world, um, number, outnumber neurons going up by about 10 to 1. So that's kind of been, you know, and there's a lot of other empirical evidence uh, to explain how this model works. Right? So, of course, this, 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 this new information, there's no, there's no water in the glass, uh, rises up to the conscious level and is therefore available for, for conscious inference. Remember, I use that information individually with a hypothesis my, my partner is normally at home, then I looked at my calendar and so forth, and so on and so forth. And of course, it makes sense that only the surprising information would, 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 would elevate to the conscious level because that is likely to be the instrumentally useful information. P is in doubt. Right? There's a glass of water. Establishing whether P right, yields inquiry, uh, yields utility. So inquire. Right? Only the unexpected information is instrumentally useful. It suggests we are not in our predictive in, predicted environment. We are out of bounds of our hypothesis states. And so, of course, establishing whether P is relevant to the goal of acting to stay in my expected environment. Establishing whether there is water in the glass, the surprising information, is relevant to my goal of having, of, of quenching my thirst, to my practical goal. So we see how the truth norm applies here. Right? P is doubted. Establishing whether P yields instrumental utility by virtue of being unexpected, surprising, and thereby telling us we are not in our ideal expected states. If we're not in our ideal expected states, then that information is instrumentally useful in getting us to act so we come back into our expected state, our environment, expected environment. Right, so we minimize, so the brain minimizes the prediction error. How? Well, it, it minimizes, it, it, it revises its hypothesis to include negation P. Right. Now, as I said, your beliefs have the default expectation. Now that we've got a revised set of beliefs, you've got your default expectation your partner is at home. But now this is in doubt that your partner is at home. Okay, so it's been doubted. Yeah, it, it would be instrumentally useful to know if your partner was at home, so you inquire further, you consult your calendar. Or you could think of this as consulting an AI system, right, rather than just a straightforward. And then you, you, you arbitrate in favor of the non monotonic inference your partner is not at home. You add that to your beliefs. This generates another experience and prediction. There'll be no response when, you're, when you call out for your partner's name. This experiential prediction is confirmed by the sense data. So it's all, there's no prediction errors now. You're back in, you know, in a kind of predict, in a predicted state. Now, the other, now, I think this is one of the kind of cutest features of this model of cognition, which is that it also explains action. And we'll just finish with, with this quick story. So one thing to notice is that your brain assigns what's called precision weighting to the incoming sense data. It's kind of like a measure of reliability. So if it's a very foggy day, you might assign less certainty to the incoming sense data. And so rather, so, so if it's surprising but it has low precision weighting, you might, your brain might favor your initial hypothesis, right, because it's uncertain. So let's imagine, um, there's a fuzzy, large, four-legged animal in the distance with what looks like a lion's mane. Right? There are two hypotheses. One is there's a lion in the environment. The other is the dog. You know, like the dogs have those uh, collars, 
you know, which they, yeah, and which was actually quite similar to the 17th century style of fashion. But anyway, I'm not sure if there's any relationship uh, in terms of not wanting people to buy or dogs. Anyway, uh, so you're, you're in a Milanese park. It's foggy. Right? Now, because you're in a Milan in a park, the hypothesis that it's a dog has a higher prior probability, because there's no zoo, as far as I know, in, in, the Milan, in Milan Central Park. I forget the name of it, obviously, the other day. And it's, 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 it's foggy. So the precision weighting on that data is low. So you select your dog hypothesis. But let's suppose we're in London's Regent's Park, which has a zoo, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it's a clear day. So the precision weighting on the incoming sense data is high. So you select your hypothesis that there is a lion. Now, the hypothesis, well, the hypothesis that there is a line there includes the sensory prediction, given your high-level goals, of being away from the line. So this is the, pr the prediction that goes down, away from line. Unfortunately, what's coming up through your sense data is that you're near the lion. So you need to minimize this prediction error. <clears throat> One way you can do that is, as I described earlier, is to change your hypothesis to say, oh, I'm actually near line. Now, that's not very good from the point of view of your high-level survival goals. Why not instead revise the world? In other words, the prediction error acts as a motor command to run. And that way, you minimize the prediction error. You end up in your desired environment, the state in which there is a line, but you're away from the line. Again, instrumentally useful. Re resolving, of, res res resolving the doubt, in this case, between the prediction that you're away from the line and, and, and the sense that you are the line. In this case, resolving the doubt is achieved not by, re not by minimizing prediction error by revising your hypothesis, but by acting, as it were, to change the world so that your expected predicted environment in which there is a line there and you're away from it align with the world. So I'm going to conclude with Jared, but three very quick slides here. Basically, what I'm going to suggest is this normative theory of this theory of truth as a norm. First of all, it respects coherentist intuitions, right? but it's, it extends coherence. So it's not just that my own beliefs cohere, but that they cohere with the world of sense data and with the beliefs of others, including, you know, I've got here a sort of icon for a phone, but it could be an AI. Okay, and they're confirmed to the extent that the predicted outcomes of actions are, uh, validate our beliefs. So this is, this is actually similar to what uh, Ramsey calls success semantics, that we can determine the truth conditions or the, the, the semantic or truth conditions of belief, preconditions for actions are confirmed or disconfirmed by the extent to which the actions preconditioned on those beliefs give the desired or expected effects. It preserves the correspondence intuition because our beliefs are adapted to successfully enable action. So we can see that truth is a relation of correlation rather than correspondence. In the same way that a map correlates with the terrain. It doesn't, it's not an accurate picture of the domain, but it correlates sufficient to enable successful navigation. And thirdly, it respects minimalist intuitions. And here you can take insights from a, an area of study called systemic functional linguistics, which looks at reasons why, for example, we might nominalize certain concepts that operate un in, the, in the unconscious, like truth. We, 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 we nominalize this norm we call the truth, and that enables us to refine the rules of inquiry, just as explicit evaluative language enables refining judgments on matters of taste. Also, recall Bernard Williams' account of intrinsically valuing the truth. Well, by nominalizing, you have some, a peg on which to hang your value. You have something, you, you might think of it as kind of hypostasization, where you kind of make, reify or concretize some concept in order that you can right, attach certain virtues or, or, or values to it. And then, of course, once we have the noun and the truth, we have the predicate. 
is true, which can serve as a stamp of certification. Look, P is true, certifies that P has been established by inquiry, and so is safe for use in further inference. It also explains one why, one, why one might say, or be disposed to make the statement, all of Einstein's thoughts are true. Because we think of Einstein as someone who complies with prescript, prescriptive norms of, in, of, of inquiry. Okay, so to conclude then, I've tried to kind of propose a metaphysically respectable account of truth as a norm that preserves some of the intuitions of, of, of mainstream theories, applies to perceptual and non-perceptual beliefs. Essentially, the truth norm instigates inquiry when beliefs are challenged or doubted, given the instrumental utility of resolving doubt. Inquiry as dialogue with agents, other agents, humans and AIs, with oneself in the case of individual agent reasoning, it's a limiting case, and with the world of sense data. Inquiry that I've tried to kind of suggest are grounded in principles of non monotonic reasoning. And as we'll talk about tomorrow, I think non monotonic reasoning, I think it has to be integrated with uh, uh, probabilistic statistical accounts. That's where you get the link between the world of sense data or machine learning uh, systems. And tomorrow I'll talk about my current technical research focus on these inquiry dialogues how to distribute this non monotonic reasoning in terms of the exchange of speech acts and the norms that go alongside making assertions and, and how non certain normative obligations, if you these prescriptive obligations, can be grounded in principles of non monotonic reasoning. So that's for tomorrow. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. It's incredible how much territory you've covered in one hour. This is, I think we have uh, a lot to think about, about, you know, before, you know, asking real questions, but maybe there are already some questions that uh, arise. So please feel free. Comments, of course, are yeah. very welcome as well. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for this. It's very, very interesting. So, I, uh, I was wondering about the way you start off, you, you talk about uh, uh, the problem of relativism for, uh, for the coherent mm -hmm. uh, Now, in a sense, uh, uh, the same problem, if relativism is a problem, I'm assuming that, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that, but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's an assumption. But, uh, it seems to me that also the pragmatic approach has the same problem. Uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, in principle, none of the constraints uses uh, rule out uh, uh, relativism. Uh, of course, you can uh, you know, build an anti-relativist constraint into, for instance, uh, the conceptual inquiry, mm -hmm. saying that you know, the ideal end is that to have one, you know, uh, or you can just get you know, be happy with the de facto uh, mm -hmm. absence of relativism, saying, mm -hmm. well, if, you know, if the community state is large enough, you know, at least synchronic, synchronic Mm -hmm. Maybe ironically you get relativism because uh, things change, you know, more. And, uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, so I guess I was wondering whether you yeah, yeah. comment on that a bit, and, and if yeah. I can just have like a little uh, last uh, sure. because uh, one problem here might be that uh, that might be a sign that uh, here what you are accounting for is not is not the, not 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 a notion like truth, uh, but more something like. Uh, uh, justified belief or, or things like yeah, that. Yeah. Some a more intersubjective, if you want. Yeah, intersubjective justification. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, actually, this is the 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 the, the route that uh, Richard Rorty takes. So Richard Rorty, was, who is you know the arch, as it were, relativist, um, argues that well, you don't need truth here in this account. All you need is intersubjective justification. Right. That's what we're aiming at. Um, however, what he does not account for, and, and there's an interesting dialogue between Price and Rorty, which I can point you to, is, is, is this unconscious engagement with a norm. What, what would motivate getting us to further inquire, to seek into subjective justification? Um, what Rorty seems to miss out is this unconscious engagement with the norm. 
I can point you to uh, the arguments back and forth between Rorty and, and, and Price. Of course, from the point of view of, of relativism, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, the pragmatists will say, well, look, you know, P is true for you and not P is true for me, but, well, that's not the end of the story. See, a relative is, well, that's the end of the story. Yeah. No, but, but the very fact that P is true for you and not P is true for me, that very fact should instigate us, instigate in further inquiry. Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not like someone says, fox hunting is, is bad, fox hunting is good. Okay, fine, let's continue on our ways. The very fact that there is a disagreement, the pragmatist would say, is what instigates, into, and there is an unconscious engagement with that, with that normative injunction to resolve the disagreement, and given some of the arguments I've proposed in terms of instrumental utility. Yeah, no, I can see yeah. that. But then, I guess my point was that uh, isn't that a sign that then uh, the notional tool that we are using uh, uh, is, is something closer to correspondence? Maybe it's a, a correlation, mm -hmm. okay, but uh, I mean, that doesn't seem to me be in contrast with what you were been saying at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just to push you in the direction of, isn't this intuition very central to I mean... Uh, you mean that the, norm, the kind of normative injunction... Well, no, that the notion of truth that we are using uh -huh. is one. So, okay, let me put it in this way. You started by, uh, with the classical intelligibility problem for the correspondence theory. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but, so, what puzzles me with, with this problem is, uh, I don't understand why it should be unintelligible uh, even if you understand P, to understand that the world is such that P. <laughs> and once you have that, you have, a, you have correspondence. I mean, you have a, a, a grasp of, of, a, of a notion of correspondence. Now, if you ask more, maybe we are in the mystery, like, like but then it goes also for the right, right, yeah. value of okay. what does it mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's a primitive way of grasp it, maybe, but uh, mm. if you can try to elaborate with that. So when I think of the classic objection to correspondence theories, I'm, I'm thinking of the classic of, of, of correspondence as picturing, as a kind of mirroring. Okay, I see that. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's got to be that very kind of core intuition. Uh, I, I'm very happy with our looser definition of correspondence in terms of correlation, for example. Yeah. I'm also very happy with the idea that there is a reality out there. In fact, some commentators on, on pragmatism, uh, particularly on Perth, have said the idea of reality is itself constitutive, a constitutive assumption of inquiry. That inquiry, the idea of inquiry about what is, by definition, requires that you assume a notion of reality. The reality might be very, very different. I mean, does that, do you only know the work of Donald Hoffman? Uh, so, so he's, um, I mean, he's just come out recently with a, a couple of books, but basically there are some apparently math arguments from uh, evolutionary psychology and um, um, evolutionary um, uh, mathematical models of evolution that suggest, uh, uh, or he, he claims at least to have a definitive proof that our, our perception of the world is very different from the way the world actually is. In the same way that when I look at a, a, a monitor on a, on a computer, I'm seeing an interface that's useful for me, yeah. but actually what's going on beneath the surface are just circuits. But it's from an evolutionary point of view, it would have made sense that we have our, our, our picture of the world is actually quite different from the way the world actually is, in a mind-independent way. Um, so, yeah. More yeah. well, questions? Uh, I have a question just to be sure that I understand rightly. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you said that uh, he's correcting the prediction error that uh, we reach the coherence of uh, among our uh, our beliefs and the not correspondent but this correlation uh, with the world. Well, Is that correct? Yeah. Um, um, correct. I would say minimizing. Minimizing. Re as it were, getting rid of the prediction. Okay. Error. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Questions? I think I have a question on that topic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, kind of worried uh, <coughs> about this because you, uh, it makes sense for uh, us, uh, you know, brains and bodies to treat this as the action 
triggered by mm -hmm. the belief of vision or minimizing the error. But then I, I thought, you know, if you make the agent an ideal and in fact collective agent, then I'm worried. Uh, because changing the world is exactly what the chief financial officer does when the model predicts something and reality is way off the prediction, the reaction usually is not to, you know, uh, say that the model is wrong, it's to say that the world is wrong, and that usually leads to bad outcomes for everyone. So, uh, it, it's sort of, I see, and I see, I mean, I see that argument really specifically for human beings or maybe robots, right, mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. limits, but I can see this kind of argument as a, because that's the sort of exactly bad practice that happens in most uh, applications of commodities to, uh, you know, for, for well, finance is the obvious situation, but you can sort of uh, turn every uh, sort of scientific uh, advisory board mm -hmm. making that kind of mistake. So climate change could be that way. Uh, we have overwhelming evidence about the anthropogenic causes of climate change, but then you know you may get that model which says the opposite, and you trust the model and you change the world. Yes, you always. And that really is worrying to me. So I think you know it, it is specific to you know the individual agent. It doesn't have to be human, but it's the individual it's agent. In individual abilities, you know, because if you do science like that, then you you're open to this kind of situation. Yeah, and I was really worried. When you were to yeah, well, I guess yeah. I guess you're talking about the accuracy of the model with respect to the world. If it is, I mean, inaccuracies, and you act on the basis of that inaccurate model, you end up in a worse worse state. It's worse than yeah, having a bad, bad model, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I'd like to, you know, I'm yeah. happy with the error. Because if minimizing the error means yeah. you know, changing the world in that way, it's I better see, to stay So where is the error. balance? Because ideally you think, well really, if you, if you act on the basis of a yeah. model, uh, really you want to change your theory rather than change I mean, the that's world. what Lehman Brothers did, yeah. right? Yeah. And you know, we know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, I take, I take the point, yeah. So, it may not, yeah, it may not transfer that naturally, as it were, to kind of scientific theories uh, and how they evolve. Yeah, um, I mean, the, so, yeah. I mean, the financial uh, theories, you find many examples because models are so prominent in there and they're so technically sophisticated that nobody mm -hmm. actually knows what goes on in, in those you know, systemic risk analysis mm -hmm. models. They get a number out of that. If it doesn't match, you know, it's the world that gets changed. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah. happens a lot there, but it also falls in all sorts of... Whenever you want your policy to be evidence-based, I think you run the risk of that kind of misuse. You know, you change the problem to fit. Yeah, yep, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, no, I see that, I see that danger, actually, yeah. yeah and you, I think you, it you should might, be... You're too ready to change the world. To line up with your hypothesis. Yeah, which of course makes a lot of sense for my own survival or the robot's survival. Yeah. Uh, so I think it should be interesting to draw the yeah. boundaries of, you know, yeah, when is it yeah. that, you know, means minimizing the uh, prediction of error uh, should be trumped by some sort of yeah. more general history. I think maybe people have thought about that. Yeah, I think that there is some work on long term planning. In the context of this prediction, yeah. you know, and this kind of exploration versus exploitation, and maybe there is some other arts and to be found it. I mean, the, the literature on this is, is enormous and extremely complex. <laughs> so, uh, um, I, good luck to any of you who want to sort of start. It might point. also be a sort of system one, system two situation, you know, because the run of it as a lion is typical system yeah. one, you know, whereas, hey, my data and the model don't really, uh, you know, fit. Or like system mm. you know, two, right? So maybe it's a yeah, I yeah. think that that's an interesting difference. Yes, because I think normally the examples given for perception being uh, action being the other side of the predictive processing coin typically 
uh, relate to kind of system one type reasoning. However, there are proposals that say even long term, you know, they're, they're being very ambitious. I mean, the whole, all of cognition can be yeah. explained as that. So they even try to explain long term planning. You know, I mean, um, I mean, so for example, one way that the idea that you really want to minimize prediction error is stay in a dark room for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, you know, because that way you're never going to have your predictions violated. But of course, then there, will, there is an acknowledgement that sometimes uncertainty is good because it prepares us for unexpected events further down the line in the, in the long term. And so, again, it's exploration versus exploitation. Yeah. Yeah. Any final questions? Uh, no, so I think we're all very much looking forward to the logic bit tomorrow. So, uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And see you all tomorrow. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's amazing. Next, then, next, fantastic. Thank you. So